Our scripture this morning is found first in Proverbs, the 29th chapter, verse 25. I'll be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. And then from the prophet Isaiah, the 51st chapter, verse 12, once again from the New King James Version of the Bible. I, even I, am he who comforts you. Who are you that you should be afraid of a man who will die? Well, this morning is the next to the last sermon in our Living Without Fear series. If you are tired of hearing about living without fear, I've got one more sermon in this series, and then we're starting on the book of Romans. You know, I like to alternate between a book study and then one that's a multi-text sermon, multi-text scriptures on a particular subject. So that's where we're headed. We're headed toward the book of Romans. But today we're going to focus on the fear of rejection. You know, all of us struggle with the fear of rejection at some point in our lives. Some of you may be consumed by that fear. It's a fear that sometimes grows greater in people as they grow older. Many people are approval addicts. Their lives are controlled by the question, what do other people think about me? How are other people looking at me? God warns us not to live our lives like that. As I said, Proverbs 29, 25 says, Fear of man is a dangerous trap, but trust in the Lord means safety. How is the fear of man, the fear of rejection, how can that become a dangerous trap for us? Well, first of all, it causes us to conform our lifestyle and sometimes even our values to whatever the majority of people around us think is right at at a particular time. Today, in America's increasingly godless culture, this is a huge trap for many Christians. To avoid rejection, some Christians become chameleons. They've changed themselves to conform to whatever the crowd or the uh, the situation around them considers correct. Unfortunately, many Christians pick their clothes, their vocabulary, who they're going to vote for, even their values, just so they can fit in. They are one way around their friends at the church, but they're a completely different way around unbelievers outside the church. Peer pressure is not just a problem for teenagers. Many adults live their whole lives conforming to peer pressure, to what others think, to what they think that others think about them. Secondly, the fear of rejection can keep us from speaking the truth. How many times do we bite our tongues today and say nothing? Or even worse, we say what we expect, we, we are expected to say, whatever is politically correct, just to win the approval of others. Even if we know that we don't believe what we're saying, even if we don't think that what we're saying is true. Third, the fear of rejection for, prevents us from giving and receiving love. Some people have been burned so many times by being rejected, they've just shut down. They vowed they're never going to get really close to anyone again in a friendship and a marriage because it just hurts too much to be rejected and they don't want to face that risk again. So the fear of rejection sometimes leads to isolation and loneliness. We build walls around us to protect ourselves rather than bridges to relate to other people who who we're afraid might reject us. The fifth reason the fear of rejection can be harmful to us is because the net result of the fear of being rejected by other people is it moves us toward unhappiness. Feeling rejected is one of the hardest, most painful experiences of life. But facing the continual practice of feeling like you've got to figure out what will please the people around you is a miserable way to live your life. People who struggle with the fear of rejection are always trying to figure out what are other people thinking about me? People who have a huge fear of rejection are often very critical, negative people themselves because they want to be able to reject other people before they're rejected. The fear of rejection often silences our sharing about Christ. We're so afraid of how others might respond that we never talk about God. The fear of rejection steals our ability to talk about the most important relationship we have in our lives as Christians. 
It also keeps us from spiritual maturity. That's because we're so focused on pleasing others, we don't think about pleasing God. Now, I know about the fear of rejection firsthand because it almost kept me out of the ministry. Even in seminary at a time when our culture was much less antagonistic toward Christians than it is today, I just wasn't sure I had the courage to face an increasingly hostile culture with the label of minister hanging around my neck. I mean, I could not do just as much good as a lay person. Well, certainly lay people can do as much good as, as a pastor can in their own realm, in the, their own witnessing, except that's not what God had called me to do. You see, the fear of rejection can literally rob us of the very purpose for which we were created. When my mother told her best friend in Washington, they were living, you know, in northern Virginia at the time, that I was going into the ministry, her best friend said, but you all seem like such a normal family. <laughs> So the fear of rejection can keep us from even being what God created us to be. So the question is, if the fear of what other people will say, if the fear of their rejection is so negative in so many ways that God warns us about it in Scripture, what does the Bible say about how we can overcome the fear of the rejection of other people? Well, first, you have to face the fact that people will let you down. Human beings will let you down. We place far too much value on the opinions of other people. We're terrified by their words. We're, we're afraid of what they might think of us. God knows this. That's why God says to us in Isaiah 51, 12, the Lord says, I am the one who comforts you. Why should you be afraid of people who die? Why should you fear people who die like the grass? People's opinions don't last. They die with the people who had them. God says, why worry about what other people say? Because they aren't going to be around all that long anyway. Well, that's certainly true. But there's this little voice in the back of my head that says, but yes, but I've got to live with them while they are here. Is it possible to live life completely free of the fear of the rejection of other people? I don't think so. We're always going to be affected by the rejection of other people, but we don't have to be directed by it. We'll always be aware of what other people think of us. None of us will likes to be laughed at or talked about or shunned, and we never will like that. But that doesn't mean that the fear of those things has to control us and consume us and conform us to the expectations of other people. Paul wanted to make this point to the people in the church in Galatia. In Galatia 1, Galatians 1.10, he writes, Do you think I'm trying to make people accept me? No, God is the one I'm trying to please. Am I trying to please people? If I still wanted to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. People are vital to our existence. God made us to live in community. But people are just human beings. They are not God. Because people are human beings, they're going to let you down sometime. There is no one in your life who will not disappoint you or fail you or uh, uh, go away from you at some point. That's why it's so important that ultimately you never put your deepest faith in anyone but God. Why? Well, because people will never love you as much as you need to be loved. They can't. We're limited, we're finite, we're damaged, we're flawed human beings. Human love is conditional, and human love is inconsistent. So if you are living to please other people, no matter how much they love you and you love them, you're setting yourself ultimately up for a lot of hurt. I'm not trying to be cynical, and I don't want you to be cynical either, but I do want you to face the truth and be challenged by it, a truth that none of us want to face and are terrified to face and that's the truth if you don't have God in your life you don't have anyone in your life who will never leave you never fail you never hurt you never disappoint you never abandon you that's why it's so important that we connect with God he's the only one who was there with us when we were born who has walked with us through all of our childhood and our young adulthood who walks through us all throughout life and then is there with us at death to walk with us through the valley of the shadow of death and right out into eternity. Eventually and inevitably, you will lose everyone and everything else. That's why you've got to develop that relationship with God. 
Which brings us face to face with an ironic truth. The ironic truth is we focus on the wrong fear. We fear people whose opinion is temporary. And we don't fear God whose rejection is eternal. It doesn't make any sense to spend your whole life worrying about what other people think, but we do. Meanwhile, we spend almost no time worrying about what God thinks. Someday the Bible says God will separate the wheat from the chaff. Someday we will all stand before God. And His opinion is going to be the only opinion that matters. We need to stop and think about that for a minute. Jesus warned us about that. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 28, Don't be afraid of people who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. The only one you should fear is the one who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Do you have a healthy respect for God? Are you concerned about what He thinks about the way you're living your life? You need to be if you want to be free of the weight of the fear of rejection of other people. The second thing the Bible says we need to do if we want to overcome the fear of rejection is to focus on how God sees us. Understanding how God sees you can be very liberating. You see, we all look around for validation. We all need approval. We're all insecure in one way or another. And I can either get that validation from God or I can try to get it from other people. And what most of us do, we try to get that validation for other, from other people. Now, in the Old Testament, there's a story about a prophet of God named Samuel, Samuel, who was told by God to go anoint a new king for the nation of Israel. The former king Saul has been rejected by God. God leads the prophet Samuel to the house of Jesse. And when Samuel tells Jesse why he's come, Jesse brings out seven of his eight sons for Samuel <coughs> to look at. David is in the fields. He's the youngest. He's not, he's not the tallest. He's not the most handsome. Samuel looks seriously at the seven older sons, the tallest ones, the best looking ones, and finally he singles out the one that seems the most handsome of them all and thinks, surely this must be the next king of Israel. But God says to Samuel in 1 Samuel 16, 7, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Now, I don't know about you, but that's good news for me, and not just because I'm short and not tall. God isn't concerned with all the external, superficial things that other people measure us by. God looks deep inside us and sees something there of tremendous value. He knows it's there because He created it there. That's the main difference between the way God sees us and the way the world sees us. The world just sees the external things and judges you on external things. All of us have been rejected at one time or another for something we've said or done that other people didn't really understand. They, didn't look at the, they just looked at the externals. They didn't take the time or expend the energy to find out what was really going on, but God never does that. God knows all our circumstances. God knows your heart. God understands you even when no one else does. God values you even when you feel like no one else does. When my children were growing up, like children of, I mean, like parents of my generation, Disney started releasing those movies. And we started buying them and watching them at home. And one of my children's favorite was Cinderella. At least my daughter was the oldest, and so she maintained control of the control. And so her brother got to watch Cinderella many more times than he wanted to. Now, I never liked the first part of that movie. I know it's just a cartoon, but I didn't like the way the evil stepmother and her sisters treated Cinderella. Cinderella was considered worthless by her family until the prince fell in love with her, and then everyone saw Cinderella in a whole new light. Now, being a pastor, I always felt I had to make theological observations on everything. And I used to tell my children, the prince is like God in this story. He saw in Cinderella something that other people didn't see. 
Now, my children never really appreciated me waxing theologically about their Disney movies, but the observation is true anyway. God is a lot like the prince. You may feel like a stepchild or someone who's not loved or who's not lovable, but if you'll let God dress you in His grace and love, He'll transform you too. That's the whole message of the Bible. God sees in us something that other people just can't see until He begins to transform us. God sees the potential He puts within each one of us, and He calls each one of us to join His kingdom and be eternally changed from a lonely stepchild to a beautiful prince or princess. That's C.S. Lewis, you know, he wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, and all the kids that are heroes in that story, they're prince and princesses. You know, and that's the way God sees us. We're a child of the king of the universe, adopted into the family through Jesus Christ. God sees us differently than the world does. And that is really good news. If you start seeing yourself as God sees you, then you can handle the fact that other people may not think much of you because you're being validated by the God of the universe. Instead of by people, you know, who have their own reasons for the way that they react to you. The third thing the Bible says we have to do if we're going to be freed from the fear of rejection is to fall back on God's unconditional love. If you're sinking right now in the quicksand of rejection and you feel like everyone has turned their back on you and you're grasping for something besides loneliness and discouragement and despair... I want you to know that God can pull you out of the pit you feel like you're sinking in if you'll just grab a hold of His unconditional great love. 1 John 4.10 says, This is what real love is. It is not our love for God. It is God's love for us in sending His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now most people get lost in that verse because they focus on propitiation for our sins. Well, what does that mean? It means, you know, this is what real love is. It is not our love for God. It is God's love for us in sending His Son to be the way to take away our sins, to pay for our sins. This is what real love is. It is not our love for God. It is God's love for us. You know, I've talked to a lot of people over the years, and they say, Pastor, I just think that the reason I don't live a better Christian life, I don't love God as much as I should. I know I should love God more, but I just don't feel like that I love Him as much as I should. And my response to them is, no, I really don't think that's the problem. The problem is you don't understand how much God loves you. Because if you understood how big God's love is for you, you couldn't help but love Him more and more and more. You know, whenever I say the term unconditional love, I know what goes through a lot of people's minds. A lot of us have been believers for a long time. We've heard this, you know, I've heard this before. I know many of you have heard about God's unconditional love. You theologically understand it. But I haven't met many people who have let that truth sink in and soak in until they, in a way that they live in the light of it every moment of every day. You see, people who really know deep down God's great love for them know that it's not based on what they do or don't do, but on who they are. That they are a beloved, forgiven child adopted into the eternal family through Jesus Christ. We just can't get away from a performance-based love because all the love we know is performance-based. Even if your husband and wife loves you dearly, I guarantee there are things that you could do, you could say, ways that you could act that would cause them to walk away from you, even if they still loved you. And we can't imagine that God is not like that, that He doesn't just walk away from us when we fail. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When you really know God's unconditional love, it gives you the liberty to grow and make mistakes and learn from your mistakes and never feel rejected by God and never worry too much about being rejected by other people. We need to ask ourselves, do we really know God's unconditional love? Paul taught at Ephesus for three years. And yet Paul, as he writes the Ephesians, in Ephesians 3, 8, you know, he says, I pray that you might know the height and the breadth and the depth of God's love. After teaching him for three years, he says, 
The key to so much of what you need to know is how great God's love is for you. Do you really know God's unconditional love deep in your heart? Let me sound like a romance novel writer for a minute. Do you know what it is to have the prince of the universe ride by on his stallion, sweep you off your feet, and love you even though you grew up in the slums and perversion of this world and aren't completely free of those influences? But he loves you anyway. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is a great mystery. The wonder of God's uh, great love. How he can hate sin. And yet, how he loves us. It's a great mystery. The wonder of God's amazing grace and his amazing love. Hebrews 4.13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God. From God's sight, everything is uncovered and laid bare before his, the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. God sees our failings. He sees our mistakes. He knows every lie we've told. He knows everything we've done. He knows our fears. He sees our inadequacies. But knowing all of that about us, he chose to love us anyway and ultimately by his power to remake us into the image of his son. Once you really know that and accept it, down deep in your life, your life will never be the same inside or out. And you will finally have the security to be able to be the person God created you to be instead of being conformed to this world and to the expectations of other people. Several years ago, Elaine and I went out for one of our elegant date nights. This was when our kids were young. We lived in Leesburg. About a half mile from our house was a Burger King. And we were sitting in the booth at the Burger King on our date night. I think we were going to go to the movie that night, but we grabbed a quick dinner at Burger King. And the only other people in the restaurant at that time, because not a lot of people, you know, a lot of people eat lunch at Burger King, but not a lot of people go there for dinner. And there's this family sitting there, four children. The husband is obviously just oblivious to everything that's going on. But the wife, you know, is trying to manage these four young children, all toddlers. She's got a baby and then three toddlers. And they are, I mean, it is just pandemonium. It is terrible. All of a sudden, one of the little boys pushes his sister off the end of the booth. The Coke or whatever her drink was that she has, it flies off. The top flies off. You know, the drink goes every place. The little girl is in the floor crying. The mother is screaming. And all of a sudden... She looks over at me because she's been looking over periodically. And, you know, then Leesburg was a small place and it was going. And there were a lot of people that came to the services. I didn't know them. Maybe she knew me. She was always looking over there at me to see what I thought of this pandemonium. And when this happened, I was surprised that in the midst of her yelling at the kids, she looks off almost directly at me as if expecting to see disapproval in my eyes and the judgment. What a terrible mother she was. Instead, I gave her a smile and said, we know what it is to have toddlers at the table. We have kids of our own. And she relaxed and she even smiled. Well, God wants you to know that he understands. He wants us to relax in his unconditional love and his approval. And when we do, we're able to handle the judgmentalness and the rejection of other human beings. You know, God's unconditional love, as I said, is such a tough concept for us to grasp. We feel like when we sin or make mistakes, God snatches his love away from us. And that's just wrong. God, the Bible says God's love is unconditional. Let's be honest. God hates sin. Sin disgusts God. He wants nothing to do with it. But it doesn't cause him to give up on us. Imagine that you were in the boat with Peter when he asked Jesus if he could walk on water. And Jesus said, come. (coughs) And Peter gets out of the boat. And he starts, you know, walking toward Jesus. But then as he takes his eye off Jesus and starts looking at the water churning around him, he he loses faith and he starts sinking. Does Jesus say, Peter, you're such a disappointment. You're such an embarrassment. You still don't have any faith. I hope you just drown. We can't even imagine Jesus saying that. No, Jesus didn't do that when Peter started to sink because of his lack of faith. Jesus reaches out a hand to help him. He didn't desert him. Jesus didn't let him sink. I tell you, if I'd had to deal with Jesus' 12 disciples for three years the way he did, 
you know, I think I would have thrown up my hands and given up. I raise the dead, I feed the 5,000, you know, I do all these miracles. They still, it, they don't seem to get it. You know, it doesn't seem to get through to them. He didn't give up on his disciples and he doesn't give up on us. But you know, we feel like that he does. When we perform well and behave, we feel like God loves us. But when we fall down in some way or depressed or discouraged, we think, well, God's pulling his love away until I do something to prove that I love him again. And that's a wrong conception of God. And it will keep you from having the strength to become all you were created to be and not conform your life to the expectations of this world. God loves you unconditionally through his son, Jesus Christ. When he looks down at you, he doesn't see you with all your mistakes. You're, they're all covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. He sees you as a much-loved son or daughter adopted into his family. 1 John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We can continue to live in the trap of wanting the inconsistent and false approval of other people or we can accept God's unconditional love and be set free of the approval of other men and women and focus on God and what He would have us to do and learn and grow and He picks us up again and again and He leads us to be everything He created us to be. When we live to please an audience of one, God God's love crowds everything else out. And we know deep inside we're totally accepted by Him and we're set free from the fear and control of others. In the Summer Olympics in Barcelona, Spain in 1992, I was touched by an event that took place in the life of Derek Redmond. Derek Redmond was a British runner. He tried to make it into the Summer Olympics of 1988, but he was injured and so he didn't qualify. He did all the work, again, to get into the 1992 Olympics. He was in the semifinals of the men's 400-meter race. He was in one of the center lanes. He had a good chance to win and to be in the finals and have a chance to win a medal. Out of the blocks, he was leading the pack. He led the race the whole way until the last 100 yards when when just 100 yards from the finish line, he pulls a hamstring and falls painfully to the ground. The crowd just, you know, watches the rest of the racers. He's a, he's a loser now. He, he limped, he falls down, he tries to get back up. He knows he's not going to win, but he keeps trying to get up and make it to the finish line. People are coming out to try to help him, but he keeps pushing them away. All of a sudden, a man burst out on the track. That, that lo one lone security guard, you know, security wasn't then what it is now. He couldn't stop this man. It's Jim Redmond, Derek's father. And he came alongside his son and he put his arm around Derek who, had, who just collapsed into his father. Jim whispered to him, you don't have to do this alone, son. And they walked together to the finish line. After the race, Derek was interviewed and he said, my father was the only one who could have helped me because he understood everything I had been through. We are all like that. We are all around a lot of people who are watching and judging how we live and how we perform and determining where well, you don't measure up, but only our Heavenly Father really understands everything we've been through, how, why we're the way, everything about us. And He wants us to forget the crowds and embrace His approval and His unconditional love as He walks with us to the finish line. This week I want to challenge you to let God's love for you crowd out the opinions and the desires to please other people. Focus on, focus on how God sees you, what God would have you to say, what God would have you to do. And fall back on His unconditional love if other people don't approve. Focus your eyes on Him. Try that for just one week and once you see how wonderful it is, to be free of the opinions of other people and to live every day in the light of God's unconditional love. You'll never want to go back to living any other way. Would you join us as we pray? God, we thank you for your love for us. We cannot understand a love that great, nor why you would love us that much. But while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
Thanks for the way that you see us that is so different from the way the world sees us. God, help us to take our eyes off other people who let us down, that disappoint us, that reject us, that help hurt us, <clears throat> and help us to focus instead on how you see us. Thank you for your love that's not based on our ability to perform, but is based on the fact that we are your children, adopted into your family through your Son, Jesus Christ. May we be different people, the people you created us to be, the people you would have us to be, the people who speak the truth in love and stand for what is right and good, no matter what others may think. Help us to live in the reality of your love and by its great power. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.